All right, great Good to be here today to tell you about this work. Um, this is joint with um, my PhD student, Sean Sinclair, and collaborator, Sid, Sid Banerjee. Um, so the, um, our motivation uh, came from actually a collaboration with the local food bank, the food bank of the Southern Tier, which serves the six counties throughout upstate New York, including the county that serves uh, the and uh, just to give you a reference, um, the food bank serves uh, over 20,000. And we're going to look at this particular food pantry program that the food bank runs. It uh, distributes 4 million pounds of food in 2019. The, the past year, it distributed 5 million pounds of food. So um, to, uh, to tell you a little bit about what this mobile food pantry um, the allocation is, is the way you think about it, is a truck, this um, with food at the beginning of the day. Then it uh, is um, is already announced in advance. So say at 10 a.m. I'm going to um, the uh, the Cortland Community Center. We're gonna uh, uh, set it up and people will uh, distribute food. Deciding an allocation to every individual that shows up at that location. Then it closes shop and then drives to another location. Um, and then again, um, distributes food at that second location. And, um, and they, you know, returns back to the, to the, food, pan, uh, to the um, food bank. And so the, uh, this is an, alloc an online allocation problem because um, in advance, we only know distributional information about the number of people that might arrive at every location. We might be able to construct this from historical data, but we don't know how many people are gonna show up on this particular day. Um, so what we wanna do is kind of uh, figure out how should we make allocations to individuals uh, along the route. And ideally we want to allocate fairly, yet we don't want to um, um, you know, have to waste food at the end. So we're gonna wanna minimize waste while allocating fairly across different locations. Um, so you can think of this as a, uh, we can model this as a budgeted sequential allocation problem where we have a principal that's tasked with dividing K different types of resources over T locations. And every resource has some budget, which is how much resource you have. And in every round, the so every round is gonna be like one location that we visit. The principal will observe some demand um, that's indicated by this N, uh, this demand of, of these agents that arrive. And uh, we will allow for the agents being of different types. So there's a certain number of agents that arrive, each has a different type. These types spec specify their preferences for the food. So it could be something like, you know, have someone who's um, a vegetarian and, or, or, you know, where they will, will only be able to, uh, I guess they have a limited set of food items that they're more interested in. And so these, this type theta could indicate um, you know, food preferences or maybe nutritional needs of the family. If it's a family with, with young kids, they have different nutritional needs than, you know, a, a youth, a, a, an adolescent or something. And then the principal then will decide an allocation to give to every one of the agents. Um, we'll assume for simplicity, a linear utility model. And after the allocation is decided, then this is the total resource consumption is simply the sum of all the things that you allocated in this round. Uh, and so, that's, this is the overall kind of way that we modeled the problem. And um, where we're gonna first need to start with is figuring out what, how do we actually set up the, the objective or the metric that, um, you know, that captures what's a fair allocation in the online stochastic setting. So um, before I continue, just uh, want to check if there's any questions about the model. Yeah. Oh, NT state is the number of, you can think of the number of people that arrive at location T uh, who are of type theta. And we're gonna think of, think of type theta being there's a finite number of types. So first um, we're gonna take an axiomatic approach to defining fairness and uh, actually use a very standard notion of fairness um, from the offline setting. So here's an ex post fairness. So meaning that at the end of the day, I can turn around and look at, uh, at look at the sequence of people that arrived and ask, what would I, you know, ex post wanted to have allocated? What would I uh, maybe desire to have in a fair allocation? And so these are three 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 maybe um, desert desert that we might want for want. One is uh, Pareto efficiency, meaning that um, I want to use all of my budget. Um, 
uh, the second one, Envy Free, that um, uh, I don't want any two individuals. So an individual will be um, an individual at round T of type theta to envy um, what was given to an individual at location T prime and type theta prime. Um, proportionally fair is that uh, saying, uh, you know, there's a naive allocation where I could take the budget and just split it evenly amongst everyone. And um, everyone should, the utility people have for the allocation that was given should be at least as good as that proportional allocation. Um, and in our particular setting, because we're just looking at linear utilities, um, the, the proportional fair property actually comes from proto efficiency and MV free days. So in particular, we can really focus on the first two. So um, in fact, this, is, this uh, has already been well studied and how Varian back in 74 already showed that in fact, the unique ex post fair allocation can be actually found um, by maximizing the national show welfare, which is this objective on the left here, um, or alternately uh, maximizing its logarithm. Um, the reason why this is useful is just because if you write it in this way, you can show that it's a convex program. So we know how to solve convex programs, right? So this is called the Eisenberg, Eisenberg Gale program. And again, this is because we're going with linear utilities, which is the simplest setting. But the challenge now is that in an online stochastic model, um, we actually don't know what these demands N are in advance, but we have to make decisions on what we're gonna allocate um, you know, sequentially. And so as a result, you, it's very easy to construct scenarios to show that there's no algorithm that can actually guarantee a fair allocation, an ex post fair allocation in an online stochastic model, because you have to make a decision what to allocate now, that decision is irrevocable. And then at the next time, you know, there's uncertainty to be about if there's fewer people that arrive or more people arrive. And, and as a result, you cannot guarantee to satisfy all these conditions. So of course, we're gonna need to ask, what's the appropriate and reasonable relaxed notion of a fairness? that makes sense in the online stochastic model. And so a quick summary um, about what our results will be before I launch into them. What we will uh, show is that uh, what we will do is we will actually find a solution that minimizes the additive deviation from the ex post um, Pareto efficient and MVP solution. And we'll in fact, not only that, we'll fully characterize the achievable trade-offs between these two objectives, and these trade -off, this trade-off between these two objectives arise from the uncertainty in the uh, demand. And um, we'll also show a simple policy that indeed achieves the, the optimal trade-off uh, on any, uh, any part of that curve. Um, and, and the policy is very simple. It's uh, based on ideas from safe model predictive control. And the algorithm and analysis do indeed extend to multi-resource, multi-type. Um, and we do some empirical work on the mobile food pantry data as well. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about what our relaxed notion of approximate fairness is going to be. It's, uh, it's actually very natural. Before our objective was Pareto efficient and MVP fairness. So we're just gonna relax these two objectives to say, what we're gonna uh, desire is to implement an alloc allocation which has low, uh, we'll call this delta efficiency, so distance to an efficient solution. You can also think of this as a waste. So it's the sum over all, um, uh, all, all resources K of the budget available for that resource minus the amount you allocated. So really this is the waste. So the budget minus the amount you allocated. And then the end, the, and this is again the MV, which is um, you know, the maximum across every two agents of, the, um, of, of how much they MV. So the utility uh, that, that the first agent has for the second agent's allocation minus the utility that that first agent has for its own allocation. Um, so we're gonna wanna, so in particular, we're gonna allow for, so in particular, if I had a solution that was Pareto efficient and free, both of these metrics would be zero. I have zero envy and zero delta efficiency, but instead now in the online stochastic model, we're gonna have to allow for some non-zero um, you know, MV or waste. And we're gonna really wanna understand how do these metrics trade off and what's the, uh, what's the optimal that you could guarantee uh, given this uncertainty. And there's a, 
One more metric that we're going to introduce that's actually much more useful, it turns out. Um, so the, the metric I defined earlier as envy, we're going to call hindsight envy, because it's saying after I finished the allocation at the end of the day, I looked back and I say, in hindsight, what is the envy that was uh, you know, incurred by this allocation? We're also going to introduce another definition called counterfactual uh, envy, called delta EF. You can think of it as the difference to the, the, the envy free solution. And this is going to be the dis dis difference between the utility of the agent uh, for the allocation that he or she re received minus the utility that the of the agent under the optimal offline allocation. So this X opt is going to be the, um, the optimal offline allocation if you had like, you know, all future knowledge. Um, and so this third one is saying kind of, well, uh, you should be kind of almost just as happy as if you know you got what you should have gotten if we had an offline uh, allocation, the, the best optimal offline allocation. So um, I guess some things I want to point out. First of all, uh, this is a very natural way of defining approximate fairness because it's defined with respect to the ax axioms. Another approach that is commonly used in the literature is to define approximate fairness with respect to like approximate solutions of maximizing the natural so social welfare. But the limitation there is that I can have a solution which is an approximate optimal of national social welfare, but it may not be an uh, uh, approximately fair in terms of these axioms. And so this is, I think, we, we do think it's important that we're really targeting these axioms. And um, I do want to comment as well that it's important that we both simultaneously require approximate parity efficiency and approximate enemy freeness, because if you only try to target one or the other in isolation, it's easy. I can get an MV free solution by giving every, everyone nothing. I can get a Pareto efficient solution by giving one person everything, right? So it's really important that we have to simultaneously target both. And, um, and one thing that I want to comment then, the reason why this third objective is really useful is that if we have low counterfactual envy, it means that the, if, if I can show that the utility of the agent, um, of, of every agent under the given allocation is close to the utility under the off, the, the true offline optimal solution, then it actually guarantees both delta efficiency is low and NV is low, low. So, and this is because, you know, the, the true optimal offline allocation has efficiency, a delta efficiency and NV zero. So if you target this counterfactual, low counterfactual NV, you actually get both. So that's why we also think this is a really useful objective, both for the analysis and, um, so let me summarize a little bit our um, results. Our results can be summarized by this figure here. In particular, on the x-axis here is uh, counterfactual MV, so delta EF. On the uh, y-axis here is delta efficiency, you can think of as the waste. And what we show is that um, there is, in fact, a first of all, uh, there's a tra trade-off between what's achievable or not in terms of these two objectives. The green region is achievable. We give an algorithm that achieves it. In particular, we want like the what you want is you want low on both axes, right? So clearly, the hard part is Ideally, an offline optimal would be like this corner point, but it's not, it's not achievable. So the red region is not achievable. We put, show lower bounds for these red regions, and we show an algorithm that achieves the green region. Um, so in particular, we show that the algorithm, like any algorithm has to solve for uh, a counterfactual MV of at least um, one, over, one over square root T. And every algorithm also has to suffer a waste that's at least one over the counterfactual MV. Okay, so um, this is the theorem stated in, in, in equation form. Um, so uh, if the first one again is, is the, the lower bound on the left hand strip that the, the counterfactual MV is greater than one over square root T. The second one is the MV efficiency uncertainty principle that the two of them have a trade off, which is that curve that you can see in the this last plot. And the third one, we actually show that the, the boundaries of that Pareto curve is actually achieved by uh, a simple algorithm, guarded, which we call guarded hope. So um, we show the results under a few simplifying assumptions. Um, first of all, we assume a finite types theta and linear utility functions. And in addition, we actually do need distri uh, distributional information on the demand. So in particular, we assume for the simplest, you can say that the demand is independent at every time that we have a bounded demand and a bounded variance. In particular, it is important that variance has to be bounded away from zero so that the stochasticness is actually you know, meaningful. Uh, 
Um, and uh, so we can kind of relax these assumptions a little bit. The key point is that we need to be able to construct uh, confidence sets for our demand. And the confidence set in particular here, we assume to be scaling kind of with root T. Um, so let me give you a little bit of intuition about the results, where the results come from. The first one, the statistical um, uncertainty principle is, is straightforward. We're gonna first explain the intuition just in the single resource, single type IED bounded demand setting. So in the setting where you just have a single resource and a single type, the optimal offline solution is just to take your budget and you divide it by N, right? So if there's only one resource and one type of individual, you should just share the resource completely freely, uh, the fair, like evenly. Um, and so the, the, the first result in this setting um, and in the, in the uh, single resource, single type setting means that um, the, the difference between your allocated, your allocation and B over N has to be one over square root T uh, with, you know, constant probability. And this is due to just the statistical uncertainty in the demand. The reason is that at the very first time point, you have to first decide what you're going to allocate the first individual. And then, um, and then uh, the, the, but, but, but that is before all of the future demand is not yet realized. And so uh, because of just the anti-concentration of the demand, you can say that the, the uncertainty fluctuates roughly at a square root T. Uh, and because of the fluctuation that's our order of square root t, you get that this um, that this uh, delta this counterfactual MV uh, with with constant probability also is at least like one over root t. So this is a simple one. The second um, uh, part of the result is showing that uh, that this uh, this relationship between MV and efficiency that uh, any every uh, online allocation has to s satisfy the this delta efficiency, this waste has to be at least one over um, delta EF or the kind of factual MV. How you show this is to show that, um, well, suppose my algorithm um, uh, gives you a guarantee that, that my counterfactual MV has to be within LT, less than L LT. Then it, what that means is that my, um, my allocation, so because the optimal offline is just B over N, um, this bound of the, on the counterfactual MV means that my allocation has to stay within B over N plus LT and B over N minus LT. So it kind of puts a, a bound on what my allocations are allowed to be. And so what, in order to even like satisfy that condition, I have to make sure that I have to be a little bit conservative to make sure I, I don't run out entirely. Because the worst scenario is that I completely run out of the budget and people at the end get zero. If they get zero, I cannot satisfy this condition. And so you have to actually make sure you're conservative enough to ensure that there's enough budget to guarantee at least um, the B over N minus LT uh, uh, in, uh, to the, all of the future people that might arrive. So there's a conservativeness that you have to have to make sure you don't run out. And then, then naturally there's the other event, which is, well, uh, I'm, now I'm hedging for this conservative event where a lot of people showed up. Um, but then with some constant probability, there's going to be uh, on the other side of the um, confidence bound that the, the demand could be close to the lower confidence bound. And in the event that the demand is close to the lower confidence bound, the, the issue is that the allocation is constrained by the fact that because I'm trying to allocate within this range, I can't allocate more than uh, the optimal allocation plus LT. So I will incur waste for, so for however much food that was conservatively budgeted, but that I wasn't able to um, kind of give out with this upper allocation. Um, so that's how you show this relationship between MV and efficiency. And um, finally, I'll tell you about the algorithm in the last few minutes. So the algorithm is pretty simple. It's uh, we call it guarded hope. It starts with first computing guardrails. Um, the guardrails are constructed. The lower guardrail is constructed by um, by generating a pessimistic allocation by replacing the Eisenberg Gale program with the upper band on the demand. So basically you look at and say, if lots of people arrived, the upper bound on my demand arrives, what's the amount that, like the minimum that I would need to at least make sure to guarantee to everyone. And then you also compute the upper guardrail. The upper guardrail has to do with making sure you wanna achieve this um, uh, bound, NV bound of LT. So you can think of it in the simple setting as uh, your whatever your lower guardrail was plus LT. So I'm, that's my range that I'm allowing my allocation to, to be in. And so, with, so I want to make sure my allocation is between these two. Um, 
And and uh, so so that's the, the guardrails picture. So the simple intuition of how you actually do the allocation is that at every time you have this conservative rule, you want to make sure you want to guarantee enough resources to ensure the lower guardrail to everyone in the future. And as long as I have enough to assure the lower guardrail to everyone in the future, then if I have enough, then I'll allocate the upper guardrail. So meaning that as long as I have enough extra to allocate you the upper threshold and guarantee I have the lower threshold to allocate to everyone in the future, then I'll go ahead and be more generous to you right now. But if it looks like, oh, you know, I, I'm only able to just guarantee that I, that I can allocate everyone the lower threshold, then I'll just be conservative. I don't give you the lower threshold. So it's a very natural algorithm. And, um, uh, and so you just put it together. The first part is computing the, guard, the, the, the guardrails using the, solving the eisenberg gale program. And the second part is just rule on how you're dynamically allocating based on how much budget you have left. And so indeed you can show um, that this does indeed achieve the, the, uh, the, the bounds that we showed on the picture for the MV and the efficiency. Um, I guess the way I explained it, I hope it was intuitive because it actually followed exactly the intuition um, so that we had before, we had the conservativeness to make sure that you, uh, the conservative makes make sure that you um, are able to guarantee this NV bound. And then the waste part of it is saying that every time I might have a little bit more than extra, then I just go ahead and give it out, right? So in that way, I'm making sure that my waste is not going to be too high as well. Um, all right, so the last part, we did some experiments. Um, it's partially synthetic, partially fitted to the food bank data. So we. Uh, we had uh, data from the uh, food pantry distribution market that uh, we used to fit these preferences and uh, for different types. And then we generated uh, a demand from a Gaussian uh, where the parameters of the Gaussian are fitted from the data. And we compared our algorithm with um, two natural variations of the algorithm where um, you can imagine a na natural baseline is to say, at every time I solve this Eisenberg-Yale program, but I just replace the unknown demand with the expected demand. Or maybe at every time I, uh, I, I, I could replace the unknown demand with the expectation, but it, either I could ignore the past allocation or I could include the past allocation. But so we can, we do see actually our, our algorithm does well. Our algorithm does, our algorithm is the, we have okay, three different variations of our algorithm because we can um, tune the uh, how much envy our algorithm is able is, is willing to to uh, incur, and we actually do see the trade off between uh, the two. So so um, so the the this one here on the left is the uh, delta E F the counterfactual envy. This middle plot is showing the waste, and in particular, we do see a trade off between as we tune this parameter that when you are harsher on uh, constraining the envy, then you end up incurring more waste. And these two other algorithms that we just um, replaced the Eisenberg Gale with the expected demand, it actually does pretty badly. It's unstable. And that's because it's not um, adjusting to the, it's not really hedging for the, um, the stochasticity of the demand. Um, okay, so this is the summary of our results. And we do have some extensions coming out that um, you should definitely talk to my student about if you're interested. Um, yeah, happy to take questions. Thanks.